Now, when you hear the word evolution, most people automatically think of Charles Darwin. But Darwin didn't invent evolution. Was he a plagiarist? This week on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Calvin Smith. And our topic this week is, was Darwin a plagiarist? Yeah. I mean, that's who you, that, Charles Darwin is associated with evolution. Yeah. Uh, did he originate that idea? That's, the, that's, the, that's what we're looking at this week. That's right. I mean, that's a strong question. And I guess one it of is. the first yeah. things we should tackle is, well, who cares? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I did, guess. whether he did it or not. I mean, you know, a lot of people would say, well, a lot of people have plagiarized other people's works. Um, you know, uh, people accomplish science by standing on the shoulders of the giants that have gone before them, of that course. type of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, is this just a personal attack, you know, as we talk about here, things here today? And uh, people will say, well, even if it was a plagiarist, it doesn't mean that the theory of evolution is true, so why are we going to talk about it? Right. Well, the thing is, many people have this idea that the theory of evolution was discovered by this brave naturalist who went yeah. on a voyage of discovery uh, that revealed, you know, overwhelming evidence for evolution. The truth. Of evolution. Uh, the truth of evolution. It provides an opportunity today to re-examine the history of evolutionary ideas uh, more, more closely instead of just adopting the popular notion that evolution was this bombshell that hit the world fully formed for the first time in 1859 right. and was solely Darwin's idea and uh, you know, natural selection was this brainchild of Charles Darwin and that he discovered it by observing the facts of nature. We'll look at that as well. So one of the main reasons we're going to explore this question is to examine whether evolution just uh, sort, sort of fell out of the facts, uh, so to speak. Right. Another uh, reason is to see if this guy really deserves the praise and attention that he's often given, right? <laughs> I mean, um, he's often claimed to be a great scientist. His, his face is on the British 10-pound note. Um, many people uh, want to celebrate Darwin Day. and There's even pressure to have right. it instituted as a national holiday in, in, uh, in some countries. So. We need to examine the difference between the popular uh, standing on the shoulder of giants uh, before you idea, which is legitimate, right. and the, yeah. the outright copying of others' works without giving them credit, which is a different story. <laughs> and uh, so expanding and exploring the ideas uh, of others is much different than simply duplicating them and claiming it was your own, and hence our, uh, our reason for modern copyright laws, things like yeah, that. Yeah, that would be bad. Yeah. Uh, the, the idea of evolution is, is not a modern concept. The ancient Egyptians, for example, the Babylonians, the Hindus, the Greeks, the Romans, all had ideas of millions of years and or biological evolution in, in some primitive form. And their, in, in, in their beliefs, all without access to the facts commonly held up today right. as proof of evolution. For example, the geologic column, DNA, natural selection, radioisotope dating, things like that, hominid fossils, uh, and so on. Yeah. Uh, but the modern theory of biological evolution probably was, was first developed by Charles de Secondat, who lived uh, from 1689 to 1755, who concluded that, quote, in the beginning, there were very few kinds of species, and the number has multiplied since by natural means. Right. Our modern creationists probably wouldn't disagree with that, but he was talking in an evolutionary yeah. kind yeah. of way. Uh, another important evolutionist was uh, Benoit de Mallette, whose book on evolution was posthumously published in 1748. And in this book, de Mallette suggested that fish were the precursors of birds, mammals, and men. And, and another uh, pre-Darwinian scientist was Pierre-Louis uh, Partenay, uh, who lived from 1698 to 1759, who in 1751 concluded in his book that new species may result from a fortuitous recombination of different parts of living animals. All right, yeah, and we'll continue on with these French names, trying to <laughs> murder their last names yeah. here as best we can. <laughs> at, 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 at about the same time, this is, again, way before Darwin, right. uh, a French encyclopedist, Denis de Diderot, I think I got that right, yeah. uh, uh, taught that all animals evolved from one primeval organism. Uh, this, uh, this prototype organism was fashioned into all those types of animals alive today via what today we would call natural selection. 
Right. Uh, another example, George Louis Buffon, who lived from 1707 to 1788, even expanded the idea at length that the ape and man had common ancestry, and further, that all animals had a common ancestor. Right. So there's a, that's, that's pretty much what modern evolution teaches today. Exactly. Author Michael uh, Macron uh, concluded that although Darwin put evolution on a firmer scientific basis, he was hardly the first to propose it. Hmm. Um, a century before Darwin, the French naturalist Georges Buffon wrote extensively on the resemblance amongst various species of birds and quadrupeds, noting such similarities and also the prevalence in nature of seemingless, seemingly useless anatomical features, such as toes on a pig. Buffon voiced doubts that every single species had been uniquely formed by God on the fifth and sixth day of creation. So, okay. Obviously, several people had evolutionary ideas before Darwin, including a, right. uh, a relative of his. And when we yes. get back, we're going to look at the Darwin before Darwin. How can a lack of erosion undermine evolutionary ideas of long ages of Earth history? Well, when geologists study the boundary between two rock layers, they sometimes conclude that there was a significant time gap between when the lower and upper rock layers were laid down. However, many boundaries don't show any evidence of elapsed time. The Grand Canyon provides startling examples. One is where the Coconino sandstone overlies the Hermit Shale. The surface between these rock layers is remarkably flat and smooth, a flat gap. Yet, according to conventional geology, there is a six million year gap between these rock layers. The underlying shale is soft rock, so it should have eroded a lot if exposed for this time. But the Hermit Shale doesn't show this erosion. This shows that the upper sandstone was deposited on the lower shale so quickly that there was not time for erosion of the shale. Something is obviously wrong with the conventional geological time scale. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. So if you just tuned in uh, this week, we're talking about was Darwin a plagiarist? And we'll answer that shortly. <laughs> now, okay, uh, we've, we've seen that there were several people before Darwin, yes. before Charles Darwin, that proposed evolutionary ideas. Another author, A. De Vries, is quoted as saying this, evolution, meaning the origin of new species by variation from ancestor species as an explanation for the state of the living world, has been pro had been proclaimed before Darwin by several biologists slash thinkers, including poet John, Johann Wolfgang Goethe in 1795, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck in 1809, and surprisingly to some, by Darwin's grandfather, the physician, naturalist, poet, philosopher, Erasmus Darwin. That's quite a title there, actually. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Erasmus proposed these ideas as well. That's right. Erasmus Darwin was one of the most important pre-Darwinists. He was the Darwin before Darwin. Yes. He lived from 1731 to 1802, and he discussed the, his ideas at length in a, a two-volume um, book that he produced called uh, Zoonomia, Zoonomia. Yeah. published in 1794. So this wasn't some obscure volume, by the way. It, it sold well. It was even translated into German, French, and Italian. Yeah, well done. So, yep. uh, biologist C. D. Darlington argued in Science Magazine that quote, Erasmus Darwin originated almost every important idea that has since appeared in evolutionary theory, including natural selection. <laughs> so, while still a young man, Charles traveled to Edinburgh, where his grandfather had many admirers. Uh, while there, Robert Grant explained to Charles Darwin at length. Erasmus' ideas on transmutation, as, as evolution was called back then. Right. But, but Darwin never once openly admitted that his grandfather had a major influence on his central ideas. Right. Uh, hmm. Some scholars even assert that Erasmus' view was more well-developed than Charles' view. <laughs> uh, British physicist and author Desmond king Heal made an excellent case for the view that Charles Darwin's theory, even, quote, in its mature form, in later editions of Origin of Species is still, in some important aspects, less correct than that of Erasmus. So, yeah, interesting. <laughs> Both writers stressed that evolution occurred by uh, the accumulation of small, fortuitous changes that were selected by natural selection. Erasmus wrote uh, that, in the great length of time since the Earth began to exist, perhaps millions of ages before the beginning of the history of mankind, all warm-blooded animals have arisen from one living filament, which the great first cause endued with animality, with the power of acquiring new parts, attended with new propensities, directed by irritations, sensations, volitions, and associations, 
and thus possessing the faculty of continuing to improve by its own inherent activity and of delivering down those improvements by generation to its posterity. All right, so large sections in, in many of Charles Darwin's books closely parallel Erasmus' teachings. Right. Uh, King Heal even claimed that the similarity between their works was so close <laughs> that Darwin's grandfather, quote, had it all charted in advance for him. Yet, quote, Charles persistently fails to note the similarity. Even the terminology and the wording is remarkably similar to his grandfather's wording, an omission which sometimes leaves him open to criticism. Of course, that criticism would be plagiarism. Of course. <laughs> One example where the conclusions of Erasmus Darwin was more advanced than those of Charles is that Charles evidently accepted Lamarckian uh, evolution right. to a yeah. greater extent than did Erasmus, a conclusion that proved to be well, a major blunder for him, actually. Right. In explaining the, uh, the evolution of the giraffe's long neck, Darwin accepted the validity of evolution, uh, you know, use and disuse, uh, although in this case uh, he used natural selection as the major explanation of the giraffe neck uh, evolution. As King Heal clearly says, for both Darwins, the theory of evolution has no mere scientific hypothesis, but, it, but the very basis of life. Right. It's, it was uh, a worldview. It's, it's a worldview. Yeah, it's them, not right? just about life. Yeah. Another, pre -important, pre, uh, another important pre Darwinian thinker was Robert Chambers, who lived from 1802 to 1871. And his book, Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, was first published in 1844. Now, in a summary of his work, scientist and author F.G. Cruikshank concluded that Chambers believed that the varieties of humans were a product of, product of evolutionary advances and regressions. And we're going to okay. look at more of these pre-Darwinian evolutionists when we, when we get back. Right? Creation Ministries International focuses on the Bible's first book, Genesis, and the creation evolution issue. Many of our speakers are scientists with PhDs who, before joining CMI, were employed in various scientific fields. Creation Ministry speakers go to churches, equipping and encouraging people with the message of the truth and authority of the Bible and its relevance to the real world. To locate upcoming CMI events or inquire about booking a speaker into your church, visit creation.com. Welcome back. On this week's episode, we're talking about was Darwin a plagiarist? Right, and we were discussing pre-Darwinian evolutionists. Yes. We were just referencing uh, Robert Chambers' book, Vestiges of Natural History, in the last segment. And now, Vestiges not only advanced an evolutionary hypothesis, but argued that the natural world could, quote, best be understood by appeal to natural law rather than by flight to an intervening deity. Right. Now, without Chambers' book, Darwin admitted that he might never have written The Origin of Species. Mm. Uh, M. Milhauser echoes that in his book, Just Before Darwin, Robert Chambers and Vestiges. Uh, he claimed that Chambers' work was a, a critically important in the Darwinian revolution for other reasons. One of those was that Chambers' popularizing of his own evolutionary theory in, in Vestiges helped prepare the way for Darwin. Right. Uh, Milhauser writes, uh, concerning the popularity of Chambers' book, he writes, middle-class consumers took up the book with the same enthusiasm they felt for the latest novels. <laughs> Amazing. Vestiges went through four editions uh, in only six months and ten editions uh, only a decade later, and it's still in print today. Right. So fiction sells, apparently, because <laughs> many <laughs> radical... Way of thinking yeah. about it, yeah. These, these radical reformers uh, were especially enthusiastic about, uh, about the book, but ironically, scientists, quote, uh, quite generally dismissed it as shoddy zoology and biology. Oh dear. Okay. <laughs> Nonetheless, Vestiges was read and discussed by most uh, of all segments of the uh, you know, British society. Equally important was the fact that Robert Chambers' works were the stimulus for Thomas Henry Huxley, who became right. Darwin's bulldog yeah. and one of the most active and important of all of Darwin's disciples. A, a big basically. promoter. Yeah. Yeah. Yet another naturalist who discussed major aspects of evolution, specifically natural selection, long before Darwin was Patrick Matthew whose influence was later acknowledged both by Darwin and Edward Blythe. Mm. Now, according to American Scholar, an American Scholar article, Matthew actually, quote, anticipated Darwin's main conclusions by 28 years, yet he thought them so little important that he published them as an appendix to his book and did not feel the need to give substance to them by continuous work. Darwin's incessant application, on the other hand, makes one think that he had found in evolution and its related concepts 
not merely a scientific theory about the world, but a vocation. Yeah, it was a, it was a worldview, really. And, yeah. and the yep. uh, late best-known evolutionist Stephen Jay Gould uh, notes that, quote, Matthew, still alive and vigorously kicking when Darwin published The Origin, wrote to express his frustration at Darwin's non-citation. In response to Matthew's evidently valid concern, Darwin only offered some diplomatic palliation in the historical introduction added to later editions of The, or of the Origin. Darwin also responded to Matthew's ire in the Gardener's Chronicle, April 21st, 1860, as follows. I freely acknowledge that Mr. Matthew has anticipated by many years the explanation which I have offered on the, of the origin of species under the name of natural selection. There we go. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now this statement indi indicates Darwin's guilt. Uh, yes. Gould tries to justify Darwin with the excuse that Darwin wasn't aware of Matthew's views on natural selection because they only appeared in, in, in the appendix, really, to Matthew's book on, on timber and agriculture. Right, and this could well be, but it uh, doesn't really justify the, uh, the slight Matthew was given uh, ever since. Um, his influence should be acknowledged today, but instead uh, he's basically totally ignored. Yeah, Lauren Isley was an American anthropologist, educator, philosopher, and natural science writer who taught and published books from the 1950s through the 1970s, he spent decades trying to trace the origins of the ideas commonly credited to Darwin. Right. Um, he summarized his conclusion in a book in, in 1979 titled Darwin and the Mysterious Mr. X. <laughs> uh, Isley reached the conclusion that Darwin, quote, borrowed heavily from uh, the works of others and never publicly acknowledged many of these people. Mm -hmm. According to Isley, one of these was English naturalist Edward Blythe, who mm. lived from, from 1810 to 1873. Christian. He, he, a, a Christian, yeah, creationist. Uh, he, he originated many of the, the ideas for which Darwin was given credit, and Isley demonstrated that, Ar, uh, that, that Darwin was a plagiarist. Right, now that's a pretty blatant claim, and how, how, could, yeah. how could he say yeah. that? Well, we're going to look at uh, some startling and, and really revealing quotes from several researchers when we come back. Is the human genome full of parasites? This might sound like a ridiculous question, but some biologists claim that it is. The Human Genome Project revealed that a large proportion of human DNA is composed of transposable elements. These DNA segments copy themselves and move around the genome. Some scientists have claimed they serve no function and have dismissed them as parasitic DNA. Evolutionists even claim that similarities with chimps in these supposedly useless bits prove evolution. But new research shows they have functions. One study revealed that transposable elements activate during embryo development in mice to control gene expression. Another study showed that these elements concentrate in gene-dense regions to control gene expression. They are not randomly spread throughout the genome as previously thought. So the human genome isn't full of parasites after all, but it's full of sophisticated ways to control gene expression. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. All right, welcome back. Our subject this week is, was Darwin a plagiarist? Mm -hmm. Now, Lauren Isley, who we just mentioned, an American anthropologist, educator, philosopher, and natural science writer, outright accused Darwin <laughs> of, of plagiarism. Right. Now, here's another author who reveals why. No less a scientific giant than Charles Darwin has been accused of failing to acknowledge his intellectual debts to researchers who preceded him. Lauren Isley, professor of anthropology and history of science at the University of Pennsylvania until his death in 1977, came across the work of Edward Blythe, a British zoologist and contemporary of Darwin. Isley argues that Blythe wrote on natural selection and species evolution in two separate papers published in 1835 and 1837, years before Darwin's Origin of Species was published in 1859. Isley details similarities in phrasing, the use of rare words, and the choice of examples between Blythe's and Darwin's work. While Darwin quotes Blythe on a number of points, he doesn't reference Blythe's papers that directly discussed natural selection. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Even Darwin's book, The Descent of Man, published in 1871, Isley argues, was largely a repeat of the ideas in, in, of others. Uh, such as uh, Carl Vogt's 1864 book, uh, Lectures on Man. Isley states that Darwin's ideas on human evolution in this book were scarcely new. Right, yes. In 1858, Alfred Russell Wallace 
sent Darwin a copy of his paper describing <laughs> his, his independently developed theory of evolution by natural selection. Wallace described it uh, in this way. He said, uh, I was suffering from a sharp attack of intermittent fever, and every day during the cold and succeeding hot fits had to lie down for several hours. Then it suddenly flashed upon me that the fittest would survive. I became convinced that I had at length found the long sought for law of nature that solved the problem of the origin of species. I waited anxiously for the termination of my fit so that I might, what, might at once make notes for a paper on the subject. The same evening, I did this pretty fully and on two, two succeeding evenings wrote it out carefully in order to send it to Darwin. Now, he sent it to Darwin because he had started correspond the, the two had started corresponding with each other a couple of years before. Yeah, now when Darwin received this, he, he was devastated. <laughs> <laughs> On June 25th, Darwin wrote to his friend Charles Lyell, I should be extremely glad now to publish a sketch of my general views in about a dozen pages or so, but I cannot persuade myself that I can do so honorably. Wallace says nothing about publication, and I enclose his letter. But as I had not intended to publish any sketch, can I do so honorably because Wallace has sent me an outline of his doctrine? Hmm, okay. So realizing Darwin would be scooped, uh, Charles Lyell, uh, Sir John Hook, uh, immediately arranged for a joint presentation of Wallace's paper and an abstract of an unpublished essay by Darwin written in 1844 to be read at a meeting of the Linnaean Society on July 1st, 1858. Uh, now, this was pretty sneaky, yeah. because it was done w without the knowledge or permission of, of, of Wallace, but it assured Darwin of a, of a chronological priority. Right. Uh, Darwin got there first. It also spurred Darwin into putting together and publishing in November of 1859 his major work on the origin of species. Right. Wallace's paper was uh, entitled, On the Tendency for Varieties to Depart Indefinitely from the Original Type. If Wallace had instead uh, sent it to a publisher, um, the world might now be talking about Wallaceism rather than uh, Darwinism. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, after his extensive study of Wallace and Darwin, author J. L. Brooks concluded that, uh, uh, quote, Wallace's ideas emerged as the core of chapter six of Origin of Species, a chapter which Darwin cited as central to his work, but he never once acknowledged Wallace. That's right. You know, what this really reveals is that this idea of evolution is actually more uh, of a worldview rather than based just on science, etc. And we've got a book uh, that we carry called uh, Charles Darwin's Religious Views. And yes. if you go to creation.com, you go to the, the web store there, you're going to be able to find that book in, a, in your checkout. If you put in CML CDRV, you can get 30% off that book and really encourage you to read it because it exposes that uh, worldview centric, you know, right. Charles Darwin had a religious view. It was a no God worldview. And we'll be back. The reason that the Creation Answers book is so popular is because it covers a huge range of topics and answers more than 60 of the most asked questions about Genesis and the creation evolution issue. Questions like, what is the evidence for God's existence? Could the days in Genesis 1 be long periods of time? How did all the animals fit on Noah's Ark? Does radioisotope dating prove that the Earth is very old? Where do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? And many more. To order your copy, visit creation.com. Well, our subject today was, was Darwin a plagiarist? And I think we've seen some things that point to that. That's what other people have said. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it's widely recognized that uh, all of the major ideas on biological evolution that Darwin discussed predated his writings. Right. Um, although Charles Darwin was, was highly successful in popularizing the idea of organic evolution by natural selection, uh, especially among the scientific community, he wasn't the originator of major parts of the theory, as is commonly supposed. Right. It's amazing. Uh, nor was he the originator of those aspects of evolution for which he's often given the most credit. That would include <laughs> natural selection and sexual selection. Right. Uh, yet he implied that these and other ideas were of his own creation. Right. In a study of Darwin, famous uh, evolutionist Stephen Jay Gould concluded that, quote, Darwin clearly loved his distinctive theory of natural selection, the powerful idea that he often identified in letters as his dear child. But like any good parent, he understood limits and imposed discipline. He knew that the complex and comprehensive phenomena of evolution 
could not be fully rendered by any single cause, even one so uh, ubiquitous as, and powerful as his own brainchild. Good evidence now exists uh, to show that Darwin borrowed um, and, and in some cases plagiarized all or most of his uh, dear child from other yeah. researchers, yeah. especially his grandfather, um, but they, were, they weren't his own. Um, they, they, he basically just uh, took from where he, he needed to, um, promoted them as his own theory, and um, didn't give people credit where, where credit was due. So, no. so wh why do a show like this? People are going to, you know, <laughs> critics especially going to say, well, you guys are just picking on him, and this is a, you know, an yeah, ad right. hominem Be personal attack. And so because he plagiarized, does that mean evolution is wrong? Well, no, that's not what we're saying. Right. Um, well, we're, we're just... Dissent, that we're just trying to look at a popular myth and, yeah. and say that this is a myth here. That's that right. Darwin did not originate this idea. Was he, was he a great scientist? Well, he made great observations. But that people had made those observations before, published them, right? So this, yeah. this concept, for example, Darwin Day. You know, atheists celebrate Darwin Day all over the world. And they're trying yeah. to implement Darwin Day as this national holiday. Seems to be growing in popularity, too. That's right. So. But... You know, usually we have holidays for people that, you know, generally considered uh, honorable, uh, that did something to, did something that was noteworthy, and really what we're seeing here is even evolutionists yeah. are saying, no, when you, when you actually look at the history here, and most people don't get taught this, I wasn't right. taught this in, right. in, yeah. in school, and so on, so where do you, where do you even find out about this stuff, because this, this isn't being popularized in any, any area other than typically creationists are, are pointing these things out. So yeah, we just want to be honest here. We're not trying to say, well, this proves that evolution isn't true, um, but it does show that this shows that evolution is a, it, basically it's essential to atheism, right? Um, you it have, is. If you're yeah. an atheist, you have to have a way to explain how you got here without God. We've done shows on this before. Yeah, and there's been atheists <laughs> throughout history, and so again, it just shows that, um, you know, again, scientists weren't jumping all over Darwin's conclusions at first. It was the atheists, it was the skeptics that were really popularizing. People like Huxley, they, they loved this kind of yeah, concept. Yeah, in right? the book that we just mentioned a few minutes ago, the, the uh, Charles Darwin's Religious Views, there yeah. is a religious component to, to, uh, to evolution. Right. Atheists need to believe in evolution. We often say they don't believe in anything, but, <laughs> or they don't believe in a deity, but they, they have to believe in evolution, have to believe in millions of years, and of course you've written articles on this. Right. And, uh, and just to take their, their hero down a couple notches here on this, <laughs> in this show is really, well, that's, that's I guess what we've been trying to do is that, you know, we need to look critically at some of these things. Right. But um, anyways, get a copy of, a copy of Creation Magazine live at creation.com slash free mag, and you can view a free copy on which this show is based. And next week, we've got the... Uh, Humans with Tales yes. on Creation Magazine Live. All right, see you then. <laughs>